Hello again and welcome to the Digital Health and Wearables series. Another fantastic episode today. And before we go ahead, I'd like to acknowledge our global partner, Spirit Digital. Please check them out. And we have another fantastic uh, supporters too. So without further ado, this week we have Chris Barker, which is the CEO and Chief Mischievist at Spirit Health Group. And that has to be the coolest job title in tech. Hello, Chris, how are you? Hi, Jeff. Very good. Thank you, sir. Okay, brilliant. Nice to see you anyway. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I prefer Chief Mischievous to Chief Executive. It probably suits my personality a bit better. <laughs> it's very unique and it's certainly very original. And uh, Chris, we continue the, the conversation. The first question that I have for you and at uh, Spirit Health Group, you are a group of four very large companies working with NHS and you've done a lot of work uh, over time with the NHS and you have substantial multi-million pound contracts with the NHS. And personally, I work a lot with the Nordic countries and they see the NHS as an opportunity and it is. But tell me from your experience, what are the main barriers entering the NHS? Um, so, so yeah, so, um, sorry to say, is a healthcare organization. Our main focus is the NHS. Um, what do I think is the main barrier? Um, so the main barrier probably is understanding the system. Um, so essentially it is a state-run healthcare system, um, giving coverage for all. That, my personal opinion, is that it's brilliant um, because it means that irrespective of someone's ability to pay, they get something at the point of need. Um, the challenge is that uh, to an outsider looking in, um, it, it, it might appear like one organization, but actually it's lots of different organizations under one brand. Um, so I think understanding who's actually doing which parts of what you'd like to engage with is the, is the biggest challenge. Um, and Jow, I've been working in it for over 20 years, longer than I'd like to admit, and I still don't understand it. It's a continual learning journey every day. Oh, fantastic. Uh, th thank you for mentioning that. That is uh, is a complex uh, organization, but also uh, from an outsider, as you mentioned, it looks like one organization and certainly has a very good reputation internationally, but in all essence of the world is, is fragmented into 212 or 221 CCGs, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so those are gradually merging um, as we speak. Um, so that number changes continually. Um, I think from April this year, there'll be 135 CCGs, uh, but there will be groups collaborating with them called STPs and ICSs. Um, we, we like our acronyms. Um, and the, the commissioning responsibilities, so the purchasing responsibilities of those organizations uh, will also shift. Um, so it's just a continually moving feast. Mm. Yeah, adds the complexity and also navigating the system is uh, is complicated. You want to highlight one or two things from your experience that you went well or the procurement, anything that you want to highlight to our viewers? Um, yeah, so so um, if I was looking to enter the NHS from outside, um, I would take the exact reverse approach that we take in, in the international markets that we work in. I'd be finding some local experts. Um, I'd be finding people that understand the system and, and understand the specific part of the system that someone wants to operate in. Yeah, so if I pick some of the things that we do, uh, or that I think we do really well, uh, and that are growing in the UK, which suggests that they might be, um, you know, we are um, supporting during this pandemic with virtual wards. Um, so we're supporting people being uh, remotely monitored in the community. Um, and that might be for their long-term condition. Um, it might be for um, for frailty in care homes, and actually engaging with the NHS from from a regional level and downwards has been has been really useful in that in that regard. Um, also, particularly in in, in digital health, um, the NHS is particularly interested in, in evidence. Um, so the understanding that something works. Uh, and that it can prove a benefit, uh, not just in, in any market, but specifically in the NHS. Uh, that does present a bit of a catch-22 situation that to get into the NHS, you have to have, it, have some evidence that you can make it work in the NHS, but you can't show you can make it work unless you can get in. 
uh, which presents a, a bit of a paradigm. Mm, sure, yeah. well, fantastic answer. Actually, it ties in really well with my second question. With the pandemic situation, I believe that you really highlighted the need for remote monitoring solutions, as you mentioned. And how do you see uh, organizations, governments, health systems, and implementing uh, healthcare technology going forward? Um, so, so um, I think with the pandemic came a realization that all the things that we already knew about digital uh, were likely to be true. Um, there was already good evidence that it that it could make a positive impact. There's already good evidence that it could could add some value and improve efficiencies in healthcare systems. But um, my my personal interpretation is that the perceived risk for a healthcare professional was always leading towards actually it's safer to have a patient in front of me to see them just in case it it, it reduced a bit of anxiety and worry for that healthcare professional that that what if I miss something because. Um, I think what the pandemic did was it shifted that balance in favour, risk-wise, of doing digital. So, yeah, I think just about every healthcare professional I've spoken to around the world agrees that they have increased the amount of remote engagement they're doing with their patients on a on a day-to-day, week-to-week, week and month-to-month basis. Uh, yeah, as a patient in a hospital trust, yeah, I am now having phone calls from my consultant for an outpatient appointment, which a year ago would not have even been a thought process, let alone a possibility. Mm. Um, how do I think governments are going to implement things going forward? So, yeah, we've had a massive shift during the pandemic. Yeah, that's that's been huge, and I think that the pace of that probably isn't sustainable. So, what we will see is some of those really good innovations and the really good things that have happened um, being embedded more into health services um, and into the way governments operate those health services and the same for private providers. I also have seen some evidence that probably change will be a little bit more incremental going forwards. So rather than radical wholesale changes, they'll be looking at changing parts of pathways or digitizing existing pathways rather than trying to digitize improve do it differently all at the same time which creates undue burden on yeah, frankly at the moment already stressed health systems mm. and that makes a lot of sense and people certainly digital is the way forward and looking to integrate solutions whenever possible of course and my last question is in your opinion what are the main factors and good ingredients that makes a successful healthcare innovation as a whole? Um, so I think um, a successful innovation in health has to understand kind of really the, the, the key of what health is about. So it has to understand that this is about a patient or a person at the end of the day. Um, it has to understand that involved in the care of that, that individual, there is a, a healthcare professional and a health system. And so I think understanding that health system is, is one of the major ingredients. Um, and that means that what works incredibly successfully in one healthcare system may or may not work incredibly successfully in a different one. Uh, so understanding that local context of healthcare, I think is really important. And then working collaboratively with the health system, with clinicians and with patients to do a step change and a gradual change towards digitization um, in healthcare innovation, for me, is the is the positive way to engage successfully in healthcare innovation. Oh, fantastic answer. Thank you so much for that. And before we actually leave the, I mean, the interview, I have one very last thing, which is not necessarily a question. Is I call it a minute of fame. I finish all my episodes with that. So. Over to you. I mean, it could be a shout out, a personal achievement, a family mention, colleagues, anything. So, over to you. One minute of fame about anything else that you feel appropriate, personally or professionally. Uh, so, I'm going to use my minute to give two shout outs. Uh, I'm going to give two shout outs uh, related to number one, every single healthcare professional every single volunteer, every single person working within any health system anywhere in the world who's been helping out during this pandemic. I think you've done a phenomenal job in incredibly difficult circumstances and I commend you and thank you. 
Uh, on a more personal note, the team at Spirit that I have the privilege of working with, um, who every day show me how rubbish I am at doing stuff and that they're better at it. Yeah, you do as proud. You're brilliant, and yeah, they're also working in that same healthcare system. So a shout out to all those healthcare workers, and indeed all those people that work at Spirit. Thank you to all of you. Chris, what a way to finish. Thank you so much for your time. I know you are a busy individual. <laughs> Fantastic insights for us to learn and uh, I mean to think about. And uh, that leads me, of course, to thank you again. Our sponsors, please check them out. I'll put them in the description of the video. Uh, Spirit Digital, they're doing fantastic work with the remote monitoring. And Chris, it has been a privilege. I want to ask you to share with your communities in healthcare, all the viewers for the support. And I hope it's a very powerful resource for all of us to learn. And please share the content and subscribe if you feel that is uh, beneficial to you. Chris, thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much.